Okay, so I'm ready to get started with actually getting photographs into my catalog. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I tap over to where it says library up here at the top right in my desktop view. And I have to tell Lightroom where to pull in photos. And what Lightroom does is it actually pulls in whole folders of photos because it has its own internal organization system in that catalog. So I'm going to go down here to the bottom left and click on import. And it's going to say it wants to access files on removable volume. That's totally OK. And right now, my card is still, pull, is still plugged in. You want to make sure that you hit OK here and OK here. You want to make sure that you don't accidentally import photos into Lightroom from your card while it's plugged in. I didn't eject my card yet, so that's the first thing that shows up in Lightroom, but I never want to write anything to the card other than photos. So I am going to shut that process down before it gets out of hand, and I'm going to go up to my hard drive here plugged in and go into my photo folder go into my 2020 photo folder and you can see the structure all exists just as it does in your folder in Lightroom, which is why it's so important to set this up correctly. And then I'm going to find my photo folder that says 2020.09.15 Law of Reciprocity. I'm going to click on that and immediately you can see all of the previews that show up from uh, the demo that I did in my listening room. And I'm going to hit import. Yes, I don't have a dining room. I have a listening room because I think listening to music is extremely important and you can eat food wherever you want. <laughs> cool. So those have all imported. And um, in my library view, I can see them all in this uh, sort of grid that pops up. I can look at them individual, individually in Lightroom in the library mode if I hit the space bar. Now that's going to come up on its own. And if I hit the button G, it will collapse it back into a grid mode. So G for grid, space bar for big, because it's the biggest button on your keyboard. If you don't have a notebook with you right now, by the way, I highly suggest grabbing one so that you can write down some of the keyboard shortcuts that we'll be talking about along the way. So pause the video, grab a notebook, and we'll move forward. All right. So after you've gotten all your photos into your library, you can see on the left in my catalog here, I have my folder that's been imported into that catalog and everything's showing up in my library. Now, my library view is really for me to kind of go through and um, determine which photos I love, which photos I might get rid of, like all of these shots at the beginning. You might have some of these also. These are all test shots. I wasn't 100% sure on the setup for my subject, uh, and they're also a little bit underexposed. So I'm ultimately not going to be exporting those or turning them in. And then all of the photos afterwards, when we actually get going, are the ones you saw in the demo as our EV becomes more and more into focus here in our background. So that's what I can see in my library mode. The other great thing that the library viewer is really helpful for is choosing which ones you want to move forward with into development and into editing and which ones you're like, meh, I have better ones. When photographers talk about the editing process, even more than, you know, dealing with contrast and color and all of those edits that you think about in photography, editing the biggest time, uh, the biggest time spent editing is actually in the culling process. So picking out which photos you want to proceed with and which ones you don't. So I, in order to do this, am able to use the Lightroom rating system through uh, stars or what they call the star rating system. If I click on uh, the first photo that I want to start with, so right here, the lighting is better. Yep. Oh. And then I turned them a little bit. So I guess it looks like this is actually my very first photo in the set. And you'll probably have a good idea of where your best photos start for your actual law of reciprocity images. While I'm on that, I'm going to hit the number one on my keypad. 
and you notice it says set rating to one and that star also becomes populated right here by my image and also right here in this tiny icon next to my image. I definitely want this one because I need to show that for my color checker card. I definitely want this one and really each time I change the setting, I need all of these in a row. Now you won't always have shoots where all of your selects are all in a row, but um, in this case, because what we were doing is so systematic, I know that the, the real meat of my shoot is right here in images 10 through 18. Now you might be asking, okay, I see the one star, but there's also two, three, four, five. Why aren't you using five stars? Well, there's a lot of different ways to kind of group or set up your photos. And I find it's, it's easiest and s most simple to just use the number one and mark everything in that first round of edits as a one star. And then as we move forward and make the call, make the edit a little bit tighter, we can start to uh, assign higher star numbers like twos or threes. If you come over here to the bottom right hand part of your screen, it says filter. Right now filters are turned off. That is the default. What I want you to do is switch that setting to rated. Once you do that, you'll notice that only the photographs you've assigned a rating to, so our one stars, only those are showing up. And in fact, I could set that filter to be two stars if I did have a two star rating on anything and everything's a one, so obviously everything kind of disappears here. I'm gonna keep this at just one star, and uh, I'm ready to move forward into the develop module to start making some changes. So I'm gonna click on develop, and here is where I can actually start adjusting the things that you typically think of when you think about editing photographs. So we have exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, whites, blacks. It is all out for us. And I'm gonna show you best practices on how to adjust these settings. But the first thing I want to point out to you guys is up here, the histogram. We talked about this in our lecture about understanding DSLR camera functions. We've pointed it out on the back of your camera. You can always view it there. And then it comes back yet again in your Lightroom module. So as I'm hovering over various sections of this histogram, you can see blacks, shadows, exposure, highlights, and whites, and each of those um, settings, each of those attributes becomes highlighted in my development module down here at the bottom, which is really, really helpful. The other thing that our histogram will show for us is, um, all of our camera settings. Now, if for some reason you forgot to write them down on your chart, hopefully that's not the case. The nice thing about your metadata that goes into Lightroom is that it shows you exactly what ISO you were photographing at, what your focal length was. In my case, I was using my prime nifty 50 millimeter lens. My aperture to get started, remember, was at f2.0. And my shutter speed here is at 1 250th of a second. And all of that information is contained up here in my histogram with my metadata. So cool. But you might be asking, well, that's great and everything, but this is really overwhelming. There's a lot of different tabs here. Where do you get started? So we're going to do another walkthrough of this with a full set of images in another demo. But to get started, I'll show you some basic edits that you can do for your law of reciprocity photographs. And we're going to go in order that you should always think about as you're editing your photographs. So if you remember, I made this first test shot with our x right color checker gray card. And um, the reason for that is because this is going to allow me to find my white balance and what my temperature should be. If you look over here at this temperature slider, you can see that I can set it to be cooler or warmer um, based on what my lighting temperature was whenever I was photographing. I think I had it set to auto white balance in my camera. But the nice thing about the temperature slider is that there's this little color picker right next to it, this eyedropper tool. And you can grab it right here by clicking on it and you can move it around just like that. 
or you can hit the keyboard shortcut W and that pulls it right out and makes it your mouse. I mentioned you can use anything that is a neutral tone uh, of gray that you might have in the frame, um, but I used this color checker card specifically so that I could select out a neutral gray just like that. And that changes the color temperature of the image. Now, if I selected something, for example, like his forehead right here, it might be a little bit different. Again, really subtle changes, but it makes a huge difference, especially if the light is changing or you uh, accidentally have set your camera to the wrong white balance settings. You have the instant opportunity to correct that just by using this color temperature eyedropper. So always look for that first. The next thing that you can do is go to your whites and your blacks. And I always set this first because it essentially creates a sort of metaphorical gate of how dark my darkest blacks are and how white my whitest whites are so that I can keep my tonal range my scale from darks to lights totally within gamut. So if and when I print this image or I um, create a bunch of postcards of this image for my friends, I won't have any super crushed blacks or super crushed whites. And the great thing about setting your whites and your blacks first is that it creates that space in which you can modify all of your other settings. So. To do this, I'm going to come over to my white slider over here, and I'm going to hold down my Alt or Option button. I'm going to click on the center of this slider, pull it from one side to another, and you're going to notice the window actually shows me where all of my brightest whites are. It's like the top of those typewriter keys. It's like the wall behind Evie's ears, and then a couple of places where the sun is shining in the background. So what I want to do is kind of minimize as much as possible some of those whites. You'll notice where the, the light was hitting in the background, these have been kind of irrecoverably blown out and the sun just hit right there. I'm not going to deal with that or worry about that so much, but all of those little tiny areas, otherwise those little tiny dots, I want those to disappear as much as possible as I pull down the whites. So I'm bringing, I'm kind of reeling that in. Looks like for this image, it's sitting at right about negative 26. Blacks, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hold down that option key, slide this around a bunch so you can kind of see how the image changes when you can actually see where your darkest blacks are. It's in uh, his sunglasses, a little bit in the shadow underneath the bandana, and then some of the areas in the background. And again, I'm going to slide this once I find those blacks, just to the point where they all disappear. So I'm reeling in that tonal range, making sure my whites and my blacks have been taken care of. Okay, so not huge, but definitely a little bit has happened. If I want to see a before and after of this image, by the way, if you find the delete button on your keyboard, there's a little backslash button right underneath it. Click that, and it will show you a before and again an after. So you can see our before image is a little bit cooler, and after uh, we actually needed to warm that image up a little bit. Cool. Okay, so now that I've set my whites and my blacks, I can start to experiment in exposure, contrast, highlight, sh shadows, all of that good stuff. So exposure is how bright or how dark the image is. And we know from our camera reading that we did a pretty good job of exposing that properly. I might pump it up just a little bit if I want, but I'm pretty happy at where that is sitting. With my contrast, a raw file typically does not have a whole lot of contrast, so I can pull this up or down to find kind of how much of that crispness I want to give to the image. Now different styles of photography and different subjects will require a different amount of contrast like with portraits 
I would never go all the way to 100. I'd probably stick more between 10 to 20. Uh, whereas with architecture and objects, you can push it a little bit closer to 30 to 70, depending on what your image is. So I'm feeling like 20 looks pretty good. I'm starting to get a really nice outline around those glasses, a little bit more definition there. Uh, highlights and shadows are going to address the lightest parts of the image and the darkest parts. I am typically always pulling down highlights in some way, especially since we have this really illuminated background and we want to highlight the subject first and first mostly. And by shadows, I'm typically pushing up a little bit to get that side of uh, our subject's face over here. Again, my before and after. So I'm starting to make some progress. Next, I can come down into my texture and clarity, which are all different sharp uh, tools that combine sharpening with contrast to give you a little bit more punch of definition. Clarity, you wanna be really careful with because it can turn uh, your, your dark, super dark and super flat. Um, generally speaking, for something like this, I might just add 15 or 20 points just for a little bit of, a little bit more of a punch to the, the sharpness of that image. We're going to talk about tone curve in a later demo, but again, this is a setting where you can really experiment with your whole histogram and address the shadow regions, your lights, uh, your highlights, your midtones by modifying your tone curve, just like the curves uh, function in Photoshop, if you're familiar with that. In my HSL, or color window, I can edit my hue, saturation, and luminance and target any given color specifically. Like if I wanted to take down some oranges here, I could do that or some yellows and things will change a little bit. Again, with this one, it's not our most beautiful artistic work ever, so I'm not gonna worry about it a ton. But given that all of the light wood in my listening room here has a really orange tone to it. The Eevee is a pretty poppin' figure in the background. I might take my oranges down like minus 15 or something just to kind of calm down the background. Again, we're making it about our subject. Split toning, we'll talk a bit more about that, but that's adding a slight tint to either your highlights or your shadows by adjusting the hue and the saturation of those. The detail window is great because uh, we have the ability to add a little bit of sharpness. So maybe I'll bring this to 50 or 60. I wouldn't push super far because then it can start to look a little bit weird, but keeping sharpening around 50 or 60 will look totally fine and normal, add just a little bit more punch to this photograph. And then um, there's some specific edits within that module that we'll get to in a bit. As I scroll down, I have lens corrections where I can check the box to remove chromatic aberration, which will really help if I have areas of high contrast where maybe I'm getting like in this in this little area of light back here, you see how there's a slight green line around it. If I hit the remove chromatic aberration button, it's going to help correct how harsh any of those um, aberrations of the lens look. So like those purple lines or those green lines that are lens issues, you can correct with that. For now, I would just advise you guys to check both of those boxes under lens corrections every time because it will identify the lens that you were photographing with and then apply any necessary corrections to make sure that the, the barrel distortion of your lens is compensated for in the final image. And if you wanna see what this looks like off and on, there's a little light switch right here next to the beginning of that module, which you can turn off and back on. And you can kind of see how it really feels like it's a lens right here. And then here, that distortion goes away, which is super cool. 
Uh, we'll talk about the transform tool in a bit, but that is for adjusting your verticals, uh, leveling your image. Uh, if you're photographing architecture, for example, this is really important. Um, if I click on any of these presets, it will potentially slightly adjust my image, but I leveled out my tripod so things are looking pretty good on that front in the first place. And then effects, that's where you can add your vignettes uh, to the piece. Like if I really want my subject to come forward, I can pull down this knob a little bit, add a vignette. can change the midpoint of that vignette, turn that off and on. And now that subject in the middle is really popping forward a bit more. Um, here's what to remember about vignettes. The minute you can recognize that there's one happening is the minute you should say this vignette should not be here. So if you ever put on a vignette and you can obviously tell that it's a vignette like that, it's too much. So proceed with caution, please, on the vignettes if you choose to use them at all in any of your images. Do not push it in one direction or another. So those are some basics of editing. And again, I'll hit my before and after button. Might pull up my exposure just a little bit more. Yeah. Just add a tiny bit more to get those shadows around the face just looking a little bit better. Maybe I'll add a bit more contrast. And there we go. I mean, that looks pretty good. We're going to talk a bit more about the, the specifics of the brush tools and masking in Lightroom in a future demo, but just to point that out, these are located up here at the top. Okay, so I've edited one photo and there's nine and you're thinking, well, how do photo editors edit anything super fast? Well, I'll be explaining that in the next demo as we go through and apply all of these settings to my photo set and export them so that they can be posted to D2L submissions and to Google Drive.